Well, yes, excited to be here today and talk about um, uh, our native fish species. Um, I was asked to come in and kind of provide a bit of an overview of, hey, uh, what are our native fish species? What are some of the concerns about them? And, and kind of just um, kind of give a rundown. So um, to get started here, um, I'm an aquatic ecologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, my primary responsibilities are working with uh, native non-game species. So um, in the Willamette, that's Oregon chub. Um, but throughout the state, I'm also species lead for the Borax Lake chub, Foss Speckled Bass, and the Hutton Tui chub. Um, I also split a bit of my time working on beaver and beaver management um, issues. Um, I'm primarily focused on um, floodplain ecology, management, habitat restoration, especially here in the Willamette um, and working with uh, Willamette ecology. Um, I'm not a, a salmon guy. <laughs> I'm a minnow guy <laughs> and a sucker guy and a lamprey guy and every other species um, in, in Oregon. It seems like when you when you talk to fish biologists, it's, it's pretty much assumed they're a salmon person. So um, I'm not, um, uh, nor am I a hatchery uh, expert. Um, and I have to say that anything I, I present here is my opinion. It's, it's certainly not the opinion of the Fish and Wildlife Service, especially because I will be talking about um, salmon and, and salmon issues locally. So um, I also want to kind of highlight two papers. And um, the top one is one that I'm a co-author on, but um, uh, it's uh, 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 the Science to Support Conservation Action in a Large River System, the Willamette River, Oregon. Um, it was, it came out, um, oh gosh, uh, in July. And um, it's a really good resource for people wanting to, to get a primer on what are the conservation issues for fisheries in, in fish and in fish habitat in the Willamette. And um, it's a good synthesis of um, kind of our our um, our place um, as far as trying to conserve um, habitat and kind of the history of conservation, the history of, of um, anthropogenic impacts, and kind of a look forward with uh, recommendations on how we can improve. Um, the second is um, a paper by Doug Markle, who's a professor emeritus from uh, Oregon State University. It came out a couple of years ago. It's called The Drainage Evolution in Freshwater Fish Zoogeography. I might even try that word. Zoogeography in coastal uh, Oregon, Washington. Um, it's um, a terrific paper about the history of Western Oregon, Western Washington, and how the basins developed and how the those basin developments are influencing where we find fish distribution today. Super paper, very, very interesting. Um, and, and kind of leading off that, I want to talk briefly about geology in fish. And there's this great quote here by um, R.G. Smith from a paper in 1981. The fish species are older um, than the geographic and geologic circumstances in which we find them. Basically, um, our fish species we have here in the Willamette are older than um, the Willamette River itself. Uh, the, there's a number of geologic factors that are in place that kind of make this make this happen. Basin capture events, where um, you know a river basin that say was flowing from the Umpqua is now flowing into the Willamette. Um, this has happened over a large time scale. It's going to move fish around. Mountain building ge and geologic events have separated our rivers from one another or separated basins from one, one another, isolating some species and bringing other ones together. Um, there's another number of biological factors. Um, speciation has occurred a number of times uh, within Oregon and within, within the Willamette, and also localized extinction events. Um, and there's also a number of anthropogenic factors. Uh, humans move fish around, and not certainly just today, but um, you know, uh, our indigenous people um, did as well. Move fish around and, and um, continue to do so to, get, to, to put new and novel and, and introduced fish into other places that oftentimes they shouldn't be. So in summary, um, the evolution of our river basins and the relationships to these fish species are evolving and not entirely always understood. So I'm going to get into that a little bit. So, of course, um, the Willamette is part of the Columbia River Basin, a very large uh, basin in, in uh, western uh, United States and Canada. Um, the Willamette wasn't always a Columbia River Basin, which uh, surprises a lot of people. So back in the Miocene, Miocene uh, period, uh, you know, from 23 to 5 million years ago, um, it's theorized that the Cascades used to directly connect to the ocean, much like the Umpqua does today, where you can think of, like, say, the Klamath. Um, these uh, uh, basins, then they may have they may have been combined, like much like the say the South Sandium and North Sandium is today. They may they may have um, you know um, uh, uh, drained together into one another. But if you look uh, west to east across um, Western Oregon, you can oftentimes see that these basins uh, kind of line up. And it's very suggestive that they, they may have um, drained you know, uh, westward to the ocean directly and not and not formed into, say, the Willamette River. Um, if you look, say, from the Sanium, um, westward, you, you get the Lucky Newt, and west from that, the Siletz River. So all one river historically. 
Um, these westward, the, the, the coast range ranges today, oftentimes have larger, um, wider valley bottoms than they should for the size of the river they're at. So it's also suggested that uh, this likely took place um, in, in historic times. So um, also, the Cascades is primarily made up of volcanic rock. Coastal plains and really sedimentary rock. And um, that will uh, be a, a feature here um, in a minute. So, um, so over time, tectonic uplift occurs um, along the, uh, the, the coastal plain. This tectonic uplift um, bisected, so it created the coastal hills. So um, uh, historically, this all would have been a, a flat plain. And as that uplift occurred, it both pushed up that the land that became the flat plain, but also created those coastal hills. Those coastal hills bisect with those rivers. And so where you had one river, now you have a Celeste River that's draining from the coastal foothills westward. At the same time, you have um, uh, the, the um, say, Lucky Mute River is now born, where you have a Lucky Mute, which was flowing westward, is now flowing eastward, back towards the Cascade Range because of that uplift. Well, you still have the San Yam draining westward, of course, there's a catchment that occurs there, and those streams then find the easiest path downstream, which is where the Willamette is going. So um, it's uh, uh, something a lot of people I didn't really think about <laughs> prior to, this is all from the Doug Markle table, prior to this paper, but it absolutely has changed how um, fish are distributed in, 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 in um, Western uh, uh, Oregon. So after that, we also had these um, uh, Great Basin salt, uh, basalt flows that came in and covered up um, excuse me, Grand Ronde basalt flows came through, covered up portions of um, the, the coastal tributaries. So the areas they didn't cover up, the Sayusla and the Umpla, parts of the Coquille and Sixes River, share fish species with the Willamette River Basin, which is kind of interesting. And those basins are primarily made up of sedimentary rock, where if you head north, you get a mix of sedimentary rock and then um, volcanic rock from those, um, from those uh, flow events. So a lot of our uh, coastal basins have very few native fish species in them, wherein the Sayusla, Umpla, and a couple of those share a lot of the same species. And in a couple of places, they have speciated from, from one another. So other things have, have um, events of disrupted bird distribution. Um, the one I'm going to focus on here is the Missoula flood event. And this was um, a lake in um, western Montana, uh, a, a lake uh, created by and as the glaciers were receding. It broke free and scoured out the kind of scab lands around Spokane, and um, as it moved westward, scoured out um, areas of Columbia and backfilled into the um, Willamette Valley. So there's a, a heavy layer of sediment that was laid down during that event, um, and um, we actually got a fish species um, that moved into from the, from the um, Mississippi drainage into the Columbia drainage during that event, which I'll talk about uh, later on. So, I bring up freshwater habitat to people, and people want to talk about, you know, what, where are our fish? And I say, oh, you know, let's talk about freshwater habitat. I think that this is what most people think about. They think about, ooh, um, habitat looks like a fresh, cold stream, you know, uh, coming straight out of the Cascades. But for me, I spend most of my time working with swamps and sloughs and lots and lots of other habitats, beaver ponds, isolated stagnant ponds. These places are oftentimes highly, highly productive, but they're not exactly idyllic. So, you know, we're talking swamps and sloughs and, um, you know, kind of this, uh, this, these habitats, a lot of people don't like to spend their time in, you know, see a lot of biologists out um, snorkeling in these kind of habitats. But if there's one thing that I want folks to take away from the, the talk, it's this, the, the, the diversity of the fish, uh, the, uh, the diversity of the land based in fish fauna and our fish assemblage is a reflection of the amount of habitat diversity we have. And so it's um, hardly a profound statement. We have lots of different habitats. We have lots of different things that evolved to use these habitats. But um, a lot of people think that um, fish habitat looks like one thing, cool, cold stream, when in fact it, it looks like diversity. So uh, there's a statement here. So we have uh, 69 fish species in the Willamette River. About half of those are native, half of them are non-native. Um, each of these species has a specific ecological niche of habitat needs. Some species are, have a very narrow band of, of habitat needs and available habitat. Others are kind of generalist and use lots of different habitats. Um, however, there are a few aquatic habitats that don't support a fish, at least during some portion of the year throughout the basin. Um, and when we're talking um, a fish in the Willamette, um, I think people uh, automatically want to jump to salmonids. And of course, we have five salmonids that have a commercial and sport um, interest 
they dominate our conversations about fish um, along with sturgeon as well. Um, you know, and, and we talked, oh yes, there's you know, 69 species, but um, I'm always worried about new non-native species. And I'm always worried I'm, I'm gonna go out and, and pull up a trap at some point and find that, um, find a new species that someone else has moved in. It's a constant threat um, when I'm working um, in Oregon. And, and unfortunately within my career, a couple of new ones have entered the, the land. So um, in talking about, I want to talk about salmon, um, and, and, but talking about salmon, I kind of want to start by talking about uh, the history of the Willamette River habitat and fish habitat in general and, and, and kind of our, our history um, of, of this stuff. So um, essentially uh, the Willamette River has been greatly simplified by, um, by man since uh, the 1850s. There's a, um, a very old historic um, USGS uh, survey from the 1850s around the area of Junction City, which so, showed um, that the, the Willamette didn't have a main channel, didn't have one main channel. It was a multi-braided, multi-threaded braided channel complex that migrated laterally east to west throughout the valley, um, you know, annually or regularly. Um, this habitat also was dominated by uh, a very dense, thick, right, and, and wide riparian floodplain forest. So as the channel is migrating, trees are moving in, beavers are colonizing the remnant habitats and creating off-channel habitats. It was a very broad network of, 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 of complex habitats um, that were initially there. So man, as, we, as, as, uh, as European colonization, as it came through, um, has greatly simplified this. We um, took this multi-threaded channel down to a single thread. And um, part of that was trying to get um, uh, water off the landscape for um, um, uh, agriculture and uh, conversion of, and also converting a lot of those riparian forests down for, for agriculture. That's also to move stern wheel paddle boats up and down the Willamette River Basin to move goods from to Portland or Salem upstream and downstream. Um, during this time, there's a, a significant amount of road construction and in, in, in the up and upland uh, habitats and tributaries, timber harvest. And you know, with those things comes in putting in roads, putting in culverts, blocking off habitats. Um, as development continues into the 1930s, here the, in the third image, you can see that a lot of the relic, um, uh, the relic channels are now alcoves or side channel habitats, so they're not probably connected during most of the year. And you get back into 95, and you can see there's a couple of remnant habitats, a lot of dikes and revetments along the river to keep the river within its channel to keep so you know property owners don't lose property to the river migrating. And you have very few of those off-channel habitats left. So the problem here is this landscape scale modification to the channel, to the floodplain, and to our tributary habitats that have um, greatly changed um, what um, habitat looks like for fish in the Willamette. So the other big one is the construction of the dams and the reservoirs. Um, there are 13 um, uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers dams, high head dams, which are uh, at least 15 meters high. Um, in the uh, in the Willamette River Basin, these primarily are on the Cascade draining uh, tributaries, and so some of them are for flood mitigation. Others do um, re-regulatory. They have multiple uses. So um, flood control is a primary one, but there's also um, you know agricultural uses uh, for for water that is for irrigation water, um, power generation, um, you know uh, recreation. Um, uh, recently, they added fish conservation as one of those uses. uses. Um, these were built uh, post-World War II, so they got started with construction in um, you know, the 1940s. Mostly start coming online in the late 50s and 60s. So um, they do two, uh, they do a lot of, that. there's a lot of impacts, but uh, two ones have kind of broken out here. This impacts the fish where they're altering the connectivity of the river network. So um, oftentimes these don't have uh, great fish passage um, opportunities at them, either for up migrating uh, fish trying to get back up into spawning habitats or for down migrating fish. So say juvenile salmon hit a reservoir. Some of these say like um, uh, Lookout Point, 21 miles long. They hit the reservoir. There's not a, a, they don't really know where to go. And these reservoir habitats get lost. They um, are septal predation um, uh, in these uh, reservoirs and also parasitism from um, different types of, of fish parasites. Then getting down through the dams often means either going down a spillway or going down a, um, a, a power canal or um, a regulatory outlet. Oftentimes these can either be hard for the fish to find or have high mortality or uh, sometimes both. And so the Corps has been working um, with local partners 
to try to mitigate these um, problems and, and, and correct them over time. So other major thing here is an impact to the fluvial process, fluvial meaning river, rivering process. Um, so those processes include sediment transport. These dams, um, sediment is backing up behind them. So all the sediment that's coming out of the foothills is backing up behind these dams. Most of it, I think it's something on, on, on the order of like 60 to 75% is, is within the dam still, and it's kind of been trained there. And so the downstream areas behind these dams are becoming sediment star. There's, you know, that the water is continuing to push sediment downstream towards the Columbia, but it's not being uh, refreshed with sediment from upstream. That, that um, further kind of channelizes the river and isolates it from floodplain habitats. Um, it has um, significant impacts to water temperature. So, um, you know, the, the dams, you know, the stream that was here had a, was, was narrower. It had a thick riparian canopy. That's gone. It's now wide. And it's staying in place. Um, there's a, a vertical stratification of, of temp water temperatures within these dams. So uh, the bottom stay very cold, the tops get very hot. And so as these dams drain down through the year, um, they're putting out cold water, oftentimes seasonably um, not appropriate cold water during say summer months. And then other times of the year, you're putting out hot water, that upper little epilimnium of hot water is being, is being let go. So there's changes to water temperature and also major changes to the hydrograph changes the hydrograph is why the dams are put in. Um, what this looks like is as storm events roll in, um, the dams are here to catch those big storm events and then let them out over, over um, a longer period. So our winter storms, uh, typically this time of year, fall, um, they're uh, trying to drain the forest, trying to keep reservoirs fairly low so that as storm events come in, they can catch them and um, reduce flooding downstream of these dams. So uh, this uh, graph shows um, since 1860s, major flood events. And um, you can see uh, uh, there, there's kind of a vertical dark line um, in you know about two thirds of uh, the way to the right on this graph. That's where the dams become, become operational. And the take home here is that um, events that were um, say a two year reoccurrence or a 10 year reoccurrence now look like uh, uh, you know, like a, a 10 to 50 year reoccurrence interval. We get very few of these events that actually look like what floods look like in the Willamette. Of course, the Willamette was built by these big flood events and formed by these flood events. These flood events maintain habitats, great habitats. They signal um, uh, uh, cues to fish and, and, and um, help them fill their life history needs processes. So um, for those of you who were around, I was around in the 96 flood. That looked like a big event. Everything was flooded in 96 and it was shocking the amount of water on the landscape. And if you look to the left, that 96 flood event was minor in comparison to what these flood events looked like um, in the last you know, 100 years before that. And that's a, a picture, I think it's around Harrisburg, of uh, what the 96 flood event looks like. You can see a lot of backwatering into those um, off-channel habitats, those relic habitats that um, uh, were once there. The, the, the water has spread past uh, the revetments and bikes and kind of filled up um, some of the, the, the remnant flood plain. So um, I want to talk uh, briefly too about water quality and, and management. So historically, and this is historically, uh, say 1920s and 1940s, the Willamette was one of the most polluted rivers in North America. Open sewage going out into the water, a lot of industrial runoff. Um, there's, you know, I've, I've read reports of tar walls just forming on the on the banks of the river from industrial waste coming down the river. So um, Clean Water Act and, and changes to how we manage waste. <laughs> Um, uh, has had a significant impact and improvement on, on um, the Willamette uh, water, but we still have uh, pollution that enters the stream, and that, and that can look like, um, you know, both, um, uh, say, uh, runoff from um, uh, water treatment plants and also, uh, you know, runoff from, uh, from other um, uh, industrial uh, uses, that kind of thing. So it still happens in, in the Willamette, just not to, to the extent it once did. But temperature, is also a, a key thing at this point. So I mentioned that there's um, kind of a, a, both a timing of release of, of water from the dams and that stratification within the dams changes the water temperature quite a bit from what it was historically. So um, within our off-channel habits, habits, I bring up off-channel habitats, these are oftentimes very productive habitats. They're habitats that, um, and I, I mean, primary productivity, which is, is, is feeding a large um, in, insect uh, base, which a lot of our species are, especially say out migrating salmon, coming into these habitats to feed upon and rear um, prior to moving out to the ocean. There are a lot of fish that also just use these habitats year round or use them to grow until they can kind of 
uh, uh, mitigate and migrate within um, the riverine habitats. So off-channel habitats, very important for a lot of fish species during some portion of their, of their life history. So we um, both have reduced a lot of these, but um, these now have very low dissolved oxygen. So um, within the river uh, habitats, the water's kind of mixing all the time. So if it's 64 degrees, it's 64 degrees throughout the water column. Within the off-channel habitats, you oftentimes get vertical stratification of water and um, lateral stratification of water. So the you know the head of the, of the habitat might be very cool, where the um, you know, end of the habitat where the river may be warm. You may have microhabitats, little benches and alcoves and things that warm up and provide good habitat for some species that, that want that. Um, and you have uh, kind of that that temperature stratification um, vertically within the habitats too. The tops being pretty warm and the, and the bottoms being oftentimes cooler than the river channel. And so I bring that up because many of our species don't really want a warm river. And so they can use these off-channel habitats to um, kind of hide out during um, uh, warm periods. However, we're getting a lot of uh, low dissolved oxygen issues in these off-channel habitats um, in, in, in more recent years. It probably has to do with the history of the simplification of the system. We don't have as much turnover of these habitats as we once did. But we also have a lot of non-native vegetation coming in, things like parrot feather and libidia that are exotic. And they um, dominate these habitats. They fill them in. That image on the left there is a slough that's filled with Ludwigia next to next to uh, the river channel. So it's both a continued area of research and a continued area of management. So um, there's also a lot of complexity to the system. There was a, a recent USGS study that was looking for um, trying to identify well what flows should we be putting out in the Willamette in its current configuration to support rearing habitat for um, out migrating salmonids. And so. We found from the Eugene to Corvallis stretch that as um, flow increased, rearing habitat increased. It's like, okay, great. There's more connection to off-channel habitats. There's more connection to, to side habitats. And it was an improvement. But then looking from Corvallis to Newburgh, as um, flows increased, habitat actually declined until you got to fairly um, high flows. And then, and then off-channel habitats were connected. So it was, it's a, it's a, it's a conundrum. On top of this, you have um, availability of water out of the different out of the different projects. You have um, what temperatures might be hitting those fish um, as you're trying to get them connected onto this habitat. So it makes management decisions really nuanced and very very complex, um, and oftentimes uh, difficult to know what what the correct decision is on some of these on some of these habitats. So I want to talk briefly about our listed. I, I'm not going to go through all of our salmonids, but I want to talk briefly about our listed salmonids. Um, the coho salmon. Um, it's native to the Clackamas River. And after um, the, the uh, locks were put in on um, at Willamette Falls, they've been able to access habitats upstream. So it's actually now found in the, in the Sanium um, uh, as well. And CSA list this threatened. Um, very easy to, to point out um, the juvenile here. It has those kind of uh, the anal fin and, and the dorsal fin have kind of black and white stripes on them. Uh, the fins on it are orange. It's very easy to identify as, as a juvenile fish. Um, we also have steelhead, which is a, a, a form of rainbow trout that CSA lists as threatened, as are chinook um, in, in the basin. So many of the issues <laughs> I addressed um, previously are the issues that are impacting salmon and steelhead. The connectivity, the adults returning to the dams don't have a good way of, of getting over up and over these dams. Um, there's a lot of trap and haul facilities and there's a lot of um, uh, ongoing management, both Corps of Engineers and others, to improve connectivity and, and uh, over the dams by, by um, adults and also from juveniles as they, hit the, as, as they come down from spawning habitats and hit the reservoir. How do they get through the reservoir and how do we get them downstream? There's a loss of that floodplain rearing habitat in the lower reaches um, of the Willamette. So after you get past the tributaries, um, there's been a simplification of those habitats. So there's not as much rearing habitat as there once was. The water quality issues, you know, both with um, uh, pesticides and herbicides and um, you know other kind of runoff, but also with temperature. There have been major alterations to the hydrograph. So um, when uh, you know uh, the, the kind of cues that fish use to move back upriver or when they expect high water, not always there, and also alterations to the temperature. Um, there's been a, you know half of our species are invasive predatory species. Uh, in the Willamette. So um, predation is an issue. Um, the loss of, of that large wood and the complexity that comes with that. You know, a, a big tree falls into the river, that suddenly creates 
a wonderful complex habitat for um, fish to hide out in and to hide under, and it might bring new nutrients into, into the system. And we've lost a lot of that um, large wood input into our stream and a loss of spawning habitat up in the tributaries and, and connectivity of those habitats. You know, there's a lot of culverts being put in place, a lot of passage barriers um, in, those, in those habitats. Also outside of Oregon, there's a number of other factors that, that are I didn't present here, but say ocean conditions. Is there an available prey base? Is there are there weird um, you know low geo hypoxia areas out out in the ocean when those smolts hit, hit the ocean? And also harvest um, uh, factors as well. So complex issue, but um, and I'm touching on it. I'm not doing a, a very good service by touching on it so briefly, but um, I wanted to give kind of a background on on this. So. Um, another one of our anatomy species is our lamprey. And so um, lamprey, I love this. It's the, the from the Latin lampetra, uh, lamprey meaning lick, and the Greek petra meaning stone. So lick stone. Lampreys, of course, have a, a, a oral sucker disc by which they um, grab onto uh, stone, and, and the predatory ones uh, grab onto other fish. So they're ancient, 360 million years old. I mean, these fish were around before animals had jaws. <laughs> so they, they're jawless fish. And, um, you know, sharks, another very ancient fish, have gill slits rather than the operculum that our, our, um, our uh, other fishes have. These guys have little gill holes, little spiracles on the side of them uh, through which they respirate. So um, very cool, very ancient um, species. Um, oh, there's, there's one of them uh, attached to a, a camera there by Freshwaters Illustrated. So they have a very interesting mouth. This is the Pacific lamprey. Um, that mouth there, you can see it has lots of teeth and it's made to attach onto the side of a fish when it's in, the, in, the, it's, in its parasitic adult form, attach onto the side of fish and kind of rasp on the side of it and drink um, blood that comes out of a fish. So um, they require, um, they have a juvenile life history that's um, you know uh, about 10 years or well, what is it, five to, five to seven years. Um, they're in this amicid stage where they're um, sitting in substrate and filter feeding. And so they have a filter feeding um, life history as a juvenile, and they require fine silt and sand. Um, we have three species in the Willamette, Pacific lamprey and the Western River lamprey are both anatomous and Paris. Anatomous meaning they migrate to the ocean and then come back to freshwater to spawn. So um, they're both um, anatomous and they're parasitic. So their adult form um, uh, uh, predates upon and parasitizes um, fish. We have a resident non-parasitic Western Brook lamprey. And Oregon and the West Coast in general is like a hotbed worldwide for lamprey species. I think um, like the climate has something like seven lamprey in it, um, which is uh, just unheard of in the rest of the world. So um, our distribution of lamprey um, in red here is the um, historic distribution. Blue is the current distribution of Pacific lamprey. On top of that, I'm gonna lay on wet river lamprey. And so they're kind of in that lower river systems and kind of the lower rivers of our, our Northern, um, our northern um, coastal tributaries and a western brook lamprey have a pretty broad range across um, across western Oregon and, and in the Columbia. So to talk about life history briefly, larva, um, you know, they, they can be an anisete or larva um, in the substrate for, you know, uh, under 10 years. Um, after that, they become um, a free swimming juvenile. Um, if you are, let's a little thing here, there we go. If you are um, a western brook lamprey, you um, then, uh, as a juvenile, you uh, kind of immediately kind of go to the adult phase, spawn and die. The uh, Pacific lampreys and Western River lampreys will actually go out to the ocean, migrate out to the ocean. Where they spend one to four years um, as as um, uh, you know predatory um, uh, fish, and then move back into the to the um, freshwater habitats to again spawn and die. Of interest, um, so some Pacific lampreys have been found to enter freshwater habitats and actually stay there for up to a year before they spawn. So they'll re-enter really early um, and it's not 100% known why um, they're, they're doing that. So uh, one interest is in the, this is um, from uh, Luke Schultz paper um, in uh, 2014. He was looking at well, where are lamprey found in larval lamprey found in the Willamette. What he found was most larval lamprey he caught were found in off-channel habitats. Of course, these are the habitats that I mentioned were either disconnected now because of, of anthropogenic impacts or just there's less of them on the landscape than there, there once was. So um, conservation considerations for the species, uh, there's physical barriers and barriers, things that are barriers to fit, to say salmon or trout might not be barriers to, to lamprey. So lampreys can like suck on to, to, to rocks and kind of work their way up walls and get over, uh, get over walls. But things that are perched, they can't jump over those like some, some salmon can and, and, and trout can. 
there's um, uh, ways that people uh, design passage structures. If they, if they have like say a 90 degree angle lip on, uh, on a passage structure, Lamprey can't negotiate that. They can go over um, less angles or kind of round corners, things like that. So there are considerations when designing things to um, make them appropriate for Lamprey. There's um, you know, a water and habitat conditions. Um, they're, they're sensitive to changes in uh, temperature, uh, to contamination and chem uh, chemicals, to DO, to pH, to nitrogen, and also to sediment and, and, and turbidity issues. Um, they're also impacted by high flows and low flows and dewatering. There's a number of times there's projects with dewater um, a stream to, to do something. And um, people don't understand that, oh, there's lamprey down in the substrate of the stream that you can't necessarily see. So um, a lot of lamprey have been lost to, um, say, coal repair projects or things like this. And there's also a big increase in predation. Um, the, uh, some studies locally, I'm, I'm thinking of one on Umpqua, I found that uh, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, heavily predate on um, anaseeds, not migrating anaseeds, um, as, they, as, they, as they try to enter um, the, the ocean. There's a wonderful website, the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative. It's, um, I have the link up there. It's the Fish and Wildlife Service website. But there's actually working groups for the Willamette for lamprey, for people who want to learn more or, or work on lamprey conservation. So I want to talk about bull trout. Um, bull trout's a char. It's um, related to other trouts and salmon. Um, they were ES, ESA listed as threatened in 1999. Um, they have the, the four seas of bull trout, they call them, but they require cool water temperatures, clean water, highly complex habitats, and habitat connectivity. Those are, those are kind of the, the four C's of, of bull trout uh, conservation. So they can be huge. That's That bull trout's a very large fish, and they live in, in relatively small streams. So they're um, kind of dramatic when you, when you come across one in, in small rivers. But um, they can live up to 12 years long. And here we go. This point's already made. Um, they can be migratory. And so they, they are resident forms, especially as they're juvenile, but they can be migratory, moving from cold streams and, and rivers to downstream to into lakes. Um, some populations actually move out into the ocean. Um, there's also resident forms. As young, they feed on primarily on insects, and adults, they, they transition to become zippers, feed on fish. Um, there's a number of issues for, for, for bull trout. Um, habitat degradation, um, barriers, connectivity barriers um, between habitats, hybridization with brook trout is, a, is a, a major issue, and also competition. And so because bull trout uh, become piscivorous and they do feed on salmonids, there was, uh, especially earlier in the, in the 20th century, efforts to try to get rid of bull trout out of some streams. And so they've been um, kind of, their numbers have dwindled locally from, from some of those things as well. So this is bull trout distribution. Um, historically, they were in all the major cascade draining basins, so including the South Sandy, North Sandy, and the Clackamas rivers. Um, the kind of outlined and um, the, anything in blue here was historic. Anything that's outlined and in red is their current range. Um, there is a population that we reintroduced into the Clackamas River um, a number of years ago, uh, 2011 it says here, and we reintroduced them um, from the McKenzie River into the Middle Fork back in 1995. We're also talking about, and uh, no decisions have been made yet, um, but we're, we're investigating whether um, the North Saniam would support um, uh, introduced population as well. So moving on from bull trout, uh, I want to talk about three spine stickleback. Um, hilarious little fish. It's a small, very aggressive fish. I've had these in um, an aquarium before, and they literally dominate the tank. I can't have them in the aquarium with other fish. They, they corral other fish and bite at them. And if the fish try to bite back, they flare these little spines out and, and um, kind of protect themselves. They're uh, uh, very numerous when you come across them um, in, in, in the Willamette. They um, have a worldwide distribution. Stickleback in general have a worldwide distribution. Locally, they're found in beaver ponds and sloughs and small rivers and, and, and streams, oftentimes associated with edgewater habitats and vegetation. But we can find them in our estuaries as well. Of interest, they are nest building. So they'll actually go along in rivers and pick up little sticks and little tiny twigs. And this uh, fish is only, you know, maybe uh, 30 millimeters, an inch and a half long. And um, they'll pick up little debris and build a nest out of it, which they lay their eggs in and protect and guard while their um, eggs develop. Some um, have these kind of bony plates on the sides, um, others don't. And so it's un unsure why more of the um, marine forms or the ones in the estuaries have bony plates. Um, they're also related to the seahorse. The, the, the stickleback family is related to the seahorse. And I think you can kind of see it in the face. Um, they are uh, a relative of, of those and, and the fin kind of positioning. Uh, next, I want to talk about speckled dace. So speckled dace, 
highly numerous and they can be found um, in headwaters of, of, of creeks and streams all the way down to large rivers and our lakes and our ponds, oftentimes in huge schools of fish um, and uh, kind of associated with substrate habitats, bottom habitats. Um, you know, a big, a big um, speckle base in, in the Willamette maybe gets to about four inches. Um, they feed right on the substrate. Now, you see, if you can see the, the picture of this one, the mouth is, really, is, is kind of pointed down. This we call it a subterminal mouth. So the mouth is kind of on the bottom of side of the face, kind of like a sucker would be. And so they're going along, along and browsing on the bottom. They're, they're um, generalists as far as food goes. Um, if it's startled, they can actually bury themselves in the substrate. They'll just dive right for rocks or, or uh, mud and bury themselves. Um, they start out startled. Like I say, they're opportunistic um, omnivore feeders. Locally abundant, they're likely a highly important food source for um, piscivorous fish, for cutthroat trout, for um, uh, any and all of our herons and um, uh, other other things that are are uh, feeding upon fish. We also have long nose days. We have three days in the Willamette. So um, in in um, comparison to the speckled days, the long nose days kind of does a lot of the same ecological things, but prefers um, shallow, fast moving habitats. So um, uh, fast moving water versus kind of the slower water that you see the speckled dace in. They prefer rocky and gravel substrates to go in. We also have a leopard dace, which um, is a very pretty, I don't have a really good picture of one, but um, very pretty uh, uh, dace. And it prefers, where this one was uh, shallow uh, moving water habitat, it prefers deep moving water habitat. So we think of the Willamette um, kind of main stem from Harrisburg to Corvallis, where it's you know, kind of swift, kind of deep, lots of leopard dace um, in those kind of habitats. Uh, next, uh, red side shiner. This is a very common, all these I'm talking about, um, the, the speckled dace, le or leopard dace, long nose dace, red side shiner. These are all minnows, they're all in the, the minnow family. Um, the um, red side shiner, uh, beautiful little minnows, uh, just uh, kind of gets this red and golden colors during their spawning habitats. A big one of these might get up to, say, uh, four or five inches. Um, they're oftentimes adults are found much smaller than that. Um, their habitats um, are, are varied. Creeks and rivers, lakes and ponds, um, out in the Willamette Mains, and you can find these things in huge schools, and, and including in, in, in deep ponds and off-channel uh, off habitats, big schools. I oftentimes relate them to trout of warm water habitats. So what trout are doing kind of in a feeded functional group, these guys are oftentimes doing, but in schools and hunting in the midwater column. Um, they're an important forage food for salmonids and birds and, and, and fish eating mammals. So um, here's some pictures of, of the coloration of these things in their spawning colors. Gorgeous. I mean, that could be an aquarium fish. Um, uh, a very uh, uh, beautiful fish mm -hmm. when you find a school of 200 of these things floating by you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I want to talk about the chiselmouth chub. So um, chiselmouth is a very interesting fish. Actually, I really enjoy these fish. They're found in moving water, large streams and rivers. And the, they're called a chiselmouth because they have a scraper-like mouth, a chisel-like mouth. You can see the bottom jaw of this guy's mouth has a scraper. And so they use it to flick um, diatoms and, and um, insects off of rocks off the bottom um, of the river channel. So they, and they're going along and actually kind of picking things off. Um, my The way I identify these things is they have a caudal peduncle, kind of a narrowing of the end of the body as it reaches the tail fin, the caudal fin, super narrow. And then it has this big, huge caudal fin. It's very um, dramatic and, and easy to identify these guys um, when you find them out, out in the wild. Uh, next, I want to talk about pea mouth. Pea mouth, um, I always have, every year I have pea mouth season. And it's a time, a time period in the year where people call me and email me confused about these fish they're finding in small little river habitats. So pea mouth spawn in the same habitats as steelhead, but like two weeks after steelhead are done. And so people have seen, you know, landowners call me and say, we saw, I saw these the fish moving into the steelhead habitats and that, you know, worry they're, they're disrupting the, the nests and, and worry they're eating the eggs. And they're not, they just spawn in the same habitats at a slightly different time. They're a pretty large fish. And um, because of that, they're all, they're susceptible to predation by a lot of different things that, that when, as they go into these um, uh, spawning habitats. They, they typically live in, in large rivers, but move into pretty small habitats to spawn. They're large, greater than 12 inches um, as adults. Tonic, they're open water insectivores, and they're um, in, in, in rivering habitats, oftentimes found in and around vegetation in lakes and rivers. Um, they're gorgeous as well. This is what they look like in their spawning coloration. That's kind of typical spawning color, uh, spawning habitat behind them, but they're gorgeous. And they'll move into these habitats in huge numbers. You'll see um, in like, say, a one-week window, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds moving into a habitat like this, spawning, 
and then booking it downstream again before the water goes down too far and they, they can't make it. So um, when you find them out elsewhere, um, they're just kind of a silverfish. Um, Looks like a lot of other species, but they have that tiny little key mouth. Mouth. Uh, they're similar to, in body shape, northern pike. And so northern pike minnow, um, a very cool fish, it gets a bad rap because in the Columbia, behind the Columbian uh, 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 reservoirs um, on the Columbia River, these things get large, very much larger than they do in the, in the Willamette. And um, as a large species, they're piscivorous and they feed on um, out-migrating um, uh, Chinook and, and um, Steelhead and, and Coho. So uh, they become, uh, they have become a problem in some habitats for how much of, of those winds they're consuming, but they're only getting to that size because of man-made habitats. In, in a normal, in a normal system, they wouldn't grow to quite that many that size, nor would they be able to as efficiently predate on, on um, uh, some wines. So uh, they like slow moving streams, lakes, ponds. They do do a migratory run, but not to the, to the extent of, of pea mouth. And they're like barracuda. They're efficient, strong swimmers and predators. Um, I've had these guys get into my fish traps before and clean them out. They'll go in there and get every minnow out of the trap. All I'll have in the trap when I check it in the morning is one very fat, happy um, pike minnow. So they're insectivorous when they're small, but they do become pacivorous um, at large size. So uh, next is, is one of my favorite fishes. This is called the sand roller. And um, sand rollers, that, this is the fish that was brought over during the Missoula flood event. So they're um, uh, in, in the uh, Mississippi drainage, they're pirate perch. And um, sand rollers are uh, a cousin to the pirate perch, the speciated as it, as it, as it came um, west. So they're found in, in rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, but only in areas that are, uh, that are associated with cover. So they have to have root wads, so like along the banks of rivers, you oftentimes see exposed root wads, or in areas where logs get into the river, trees fall in the river, the root wads of those of those things in the river. So they're highly associated. You don't really find them elsewhere, except where you, you have um, uh, undercut banks or root wad habitats. They're cool. You pick them up and they have these kind of rough, ten, we call them tenoid scales, or kind of rough ridge scales, kind of like, um, like say a bluegill might have, um, very rough to the touch, almost sandpaper feeling in your hand. And they come in lots of different colors, um, blues and pinks and purple, purples and yellows. They're acrobatic. So when you get them into a tank or into a, a bucket, they have to put their ventral surface against another surface. So oftentimes if there's say an undercut bank, these guys will be upside down in the water with that, with their bottom facing whatever that surface is. So they're kind of hilarious to, to see um, in the wild because they're always um, at some weird angle that you don't expect a fish to be at um, in, in the water column. So they're one of the few, I don't know if you can see it here in my hand, but they're one of the few fish, uh, non-salmonids to have an adipose fin. So they have that tiny little adipose, second dorsal fin, that adipose fin on um, uh, near their puddle Um By biomass, this is probably, mm -hmm one of the, 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 the most abundant species in the Willamette. It's a large scale sucker. They're huge, they live for a long time. They, um, they're numerous. We have lots and lots and lots of large scale suckers and they're by biomass, one of our major fish. Um, found in, in streams and rivers, lakes and ponds, they migrate um, to spawn. So they're oftentimes, they'll oftentimes hang out in deep water habitats and then move back into streams um, uh, uh, to spawn. You can see their face. They have that, that this is like very much a subterminal mouth. The mouth is pointed directly at the substrate. And so they kind of go along and, and, and graze on the bottom, picking up rocks, scraping off rocks, and kind of cleaning that, whatever they're, whatever they're coming across, they're generalists. If it's invertebrates, if it's algae, if it's diatoms, not really picky. And um, huge uh, source of food for um, birds and for mammals. Uh, if, you're, if you ever see, um, you know, uh, um, uh, any any kind of like you know a, a hawks or anything coming by with um, with a fish, very likely it's a large scale sucker. Um, for whatever reason, uh, large scale suckers are very popular with my crews, and they uh, like everyone who <laughs> catches a large one always has to like you know kind of be affectionate with the dang thing. So uh, they're a very fun fish, and um, like I say, uh, an important um, part of our our, our ecosystem. Uh, next, I want to talk about sculpin. Sculpin are um, kind of a cryptic species. I, I put 16 down here. That's how many we have in Oregon. We probably have, you know, maybe um, six to 10 in the Willamette. They're kind of confusing to distinguish. All sculpin kind of look the same to most of us. A couple of them have distinguishing characteristics. There's a prickly sculpin that has tenoid scales and rough scales. There's um, one Potus rotheus that has kind of, kind of some dashes on the side of it, but kind of hard to tell most of them apart. 
they're found, this is oftentimes the first species. If you were walking down from the headwaters of stream downstream, this is probably mm. the first fish we're going to encounter. So it's um, they're found in the headwater streams all the way down to our large rivers and lakes. Um, you even find them out in the estuaries. So um, they're bottom dwelling. So they sit on the bottom. You can see they have big mouth, big head and kind of a tiny little body. This is a sprinter's body. This is, um, they sit on the bottom, their eyes are kind of pointed upwards and they're waiting for something to come by. They move with very short bursts of speed um, and to catch prey. They're often nocturnal, but primarily feeding on aquatic insects, but also snails, mussels, amphibians, other fish, other sculpin. They're, they're um, a very aggressive species, despite the fact that they're relatively small. And um, here's some of the, the, I think that one on the top is kind of cute. But here are some of the diversity of, uh, of our sculpin, um, just kind of what the coloration looks like. Uh, next, I want to talk about mountain whitefish. They're another Salmonid. They're um, highly related to trout and salmon. Um, they have um, the most widely distributed Salmonid in Western North America. So they're found um, all over Western North America, through Canada, um, in lots, of, lots and lots of different river systems. So they're also found in lots of different habitats, fall, found in, in small um, freshwater um, uh, headwater streams. Um, all the way down to uh, large rivers and, and some of our lakes. Um, they're insectivores. They have a, a fairly small mouth, downturned mouth. They're, um, they actually feed by um, uh, using their caudal fins, kind of their arm fins, and actually um, stirring up bottom uh, uh, habitats, bottom of uh, the, the substrate habitats, and picking at things that are coming up out of that. Um, likely also another migratory fish species. Um, and very cool. They're, they're a neat fish whenever I, I come across them. Their body form looks a bit like a minnow. They have, kind of have that kind of uh, minnow body form versus um, most of our other salmonids, um, but a neat species. They get, kind of get a bad rap from fishermen who see them kind of as, as an attractive um, trash fish, um, but they're a very cool part of, of our ecosystem and an important fish food for um, a lot of mammals uh, and birds. I also mentioned we have a heck of a lot of non-native fish, 33 non-native fish, and it's that's going to rise in the future likely. So um, most were introduced for sport fishing. Um, some have come in from aquariums and from, um, or for uh, say, mosquito control as well. Most of these are super aggressive predatory species. Um, they compete with and outcompete or directly prey upon a lot of our native fish. Um, and so this includes both rearing salmonids or lamprey and other small bodied fish. We're oftentimes inhabiting a lot of different habitats too. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of our fish will dive into vegetation for cover. And that's exactly where um, bluegill and, and bass are hanging out and trying to feed. So um, their um, strategies for feeding don't necessarily ecologically match with the strategies that our fish are using to try to get away from them. Um, some of these include, say, our largemouth and smallmouth bass, all of our sunfish species. So the bluegill, the warmouth, pumpkin seed, green sunfish, um, yellow perch, which is um, uh, kind of a, adjacent to, to, to the bass species, all of our bullhead, so the yellow and brown bullhead locally, but also black bullhead elsewhere in Oregon, um, western mosquito fish and banded killifish, um, those are, are two kind of non-predatory species, although western mosquito fish are, are, are very aggressive species, but um, brought in for western mosquito fish for um, mosquito control, and unfortunately, recent studies have shown that our native minnows are much better at controlling mosquitoes than non-native mosquito fish, which is probably not surprising, but it's unfortunate. Um, and um, uh, the um, other fish have been brought in for, for um, uh, aquarium use. We also have, like say, um, other minnow species, other, other type of prints, say carp, which uh, the image of me I showed the first part of the talk, it was a big fish, that's a carp, um, uh, one, of the, one of the larger of the minnows um, uh, out there. And also fathead minnows brought in primarily as, as a way of testing water quality in areas. Um, lastly, I want to talk about my favorite fish, uh, the Oregon chum. And of all the fish we've talked about, um, every one of them can be found somewhere else. I kind of mentioned that like, hey, these, these, these fish species are widely distributed. Some of them have been uh, moved around by geologic events. Well, the Oregon chub is the only Willamette River Basin endemic. Endemic meaning it is found nowhere else in the world besides this location. So it's, it's, our, it's our Willamette's fish. Um, it's uh, an off-channel habitat kind of audible. So it requires um, sloughs, beaver ponds, slow moving creeks, and it requires these kind of off channel, uh, slow moving waters. So, um, you know, a lot of these fish species, we don't really keep an active monitoring program going for them. Sand rollers, for instance, we, I about, oh gosh, it was 2005, the last time we did a rigorous survey to go out and see like, are sand rollers okay? No one's watching them to see if there's something, if they're, if they're in decline. And, um, that's the history of Oregon chub. So 
in the 80s um, and, and up to the early 90s, um, biologists from Oregon State University, um, uh, Carl Vaughn and, and Doug Markle, that were going out and revisiting or, uh, Oregon chub habitats and were not finding them in a lot of their historic locations. And um, this kind of raised the red flags that, um, of say, I think it was 21 historic habitats. They were only in eight of those remaining ones. There's about a thousand fish left. And so this led to a petition to list the species in 1990. Um, and uh, a multi-agency conservation agreement and, and a working group came together in 92 to start working together and saying, how can we, how can we help try to, try to conserve the Oregon chub? It was listed as endangered in 1993, and it had um, a low potential for recovery in 1993. We thought um, that they might only be able to hold on in a, in a couple habitats or isolated habitats. Um, well, that working group um, got together and did its job. And in um, 2010, it was downlisted to threatened for endangered status to threatened status. And then in 2015, it was delisted. And it was, it's the first fish to be recovered under the Endangered Species Act. Other fish have been removed from the act, either through like a um, uh, taxonomic version that realized, oh, this we actually are calling these two species something separate and they're actually together and they've been uh, removed for taxonomic revision or because of extinction. The other way you get off the endangered species list, sadly. So um, this one, we celebrate it. It's the first fish off the ESA. So of interest, uh, the next four fish off the ESA is Modoc sucker, which is also in part of its ranges in Oregon. The fox is speckled dace, which is one of the species I, I work on, and, and a fellow Paul Shear in, in Corvallis kind of led that recovery program, um, was the third off the list. And the borax slug chub is the fourth off the list. And uh, Paul um, and, and I also work on, on that species as well. So um, Oregon's kind of paving the way on, on a lot of these delistings. Since then, there have been a couple other species delisted around the country um, and, and more to come. So this was, um, this is the range of, of Oregon chub. And um, this was, I think this is in 2020, uh, was our range of Oregon chub, kind of where we, were, where we have been serving through the basin for them and where they're currently located. So when we started, there's eight populations, uh, a couple in the, in the, in the San, in North Sanium, and one on the Mary's River in uh, Finley Wildlife Refuge, and a couple in the Middle Fork Willamette. And since then, um, due to um, restoration activities and um, due to uh, um, uh, uh, enhancement projects, um, we've worked with a lot of private landowners to build ponds out in, say, farm fields or um, in, in agricultural areas to um, the uh, refuge habitats for the fish. And so we've, we've uh, created new populations through those. We've enhanced previous ponds. We've um, worked with Corps of Engineers and others to um, uh, reconnect off-channel habitats and uh, do flow management in the ways that will prefer the, the, to, to, to provide habitat that Oregon chub prefers over um, non-native species. And so through these efforts, we've been able to increase the number of populations uh, greatly. And so uh, you see the number at, at delisting. We were 87 populations at delisting in 2015. Today, we're at over 130. So um, the, the conservation of Oregon chub continues even after the um, decision to delist it was, was, was made. So it was achieved through a lot of a close network of partners. So um, a lot of partnerships with private landowners, with farmers um, and, and timber producers, um, a, a lot of uh, building relationships between our state and local partners and, um, and our federal partners to kind of get um, cool resources and find opportunities for conservation, um, making introductions in, into novel habitats, we also documented a number of previously unknown populations, especially in river basins where we didn't know they existed. Um, so in uh, the summer of, of 2019, uh, something special happened for us. And so uh, when the Oregon shovel was recovered, um, it was recovered in the tributaries, it covered Middle Fork Willamette, San Ian, and the Mary's River Basin, and all the tributaries that had Oregon shovel. We have all these populations in, but historically, all the historic populations for Oregon shovel were out in the, or most of the known populations were in the main stem habitats where Oregon chub had been replaced with non-game fish. And so it was always kind of a bit of a sore spot. Like, yeah, we, they're recovered, but they're not in this habitat where they were once thriving. And so in uh, 2019, we were working with McKenzie River Trust and um, on, a, on a habitat um, right at the mouth of the McKenzie River. And we found that Oregon chub had um, colonized um, a, a habitat, a newly made slough habitat on the main stem of land. And so it was a very neat moment for us to actually see this fish kind of, if you build it, they will come 
recolonizing the Willamette River main stem from one of the tributaries, a very special moment. And since then they've colonized the second habitat downstream and you know, we hope they continue to thrive in those habitats and, and, and do more of that. So parting thoughts for me, um, again, I'm just kind of parroting what I said at the beginning um, of, of, my, of my talk, but um, I just want to state again that the fish fauna that we have in the Willamette River is a reflection of the highly diverse habitats of the Willamette River and its tributaries along its flood plains. So um, the species that I've kind of focused on today, they all share a lot of the same impacts, habitat loss and loss of, of connectivity um, uh, to upstream habitats or lateral habitats, um, you know, from the construction of the dams, from the loss of, of natural flow regimes and, and altered temperature regimes, of the direct loss of habitat, of, of the loss of the floodplain kind of weighted nature of the land river, uh, river network. Um, but I hope that through these lessons learned um, due to the recovery of Oregon chub and through the work that we're doing with um, you know, salmon and lamprey and bull trout, that we can uh, closer collaborate with our partners to, because they share, because these fish share so many commonalities in the things that are impacting them, that we can pool these resources together to continue the con conservation of a lot of these um, native non-game species that a lot of us don't really focus on and prioritize. So with that, um, I will be happy to take some questions. What do sand rollers eat? Oh, they eat insects. So they're little insectivores. And are there bridge lip suckers in the Willamette? There are no bridge lip suckers in the Willamette. I love bridge lip suckers, but you're going to find those out in Eastern Oregon. And um, Willamette, we have, uh, I focus on the large scale sucker because it's so cool. We also have mountain suckers and they're little Cascadian suckers, which are smaller and um even as a fish nerd, I would probably have a hard time distinguishing between the two of them. Um, but yes, we have those two. Interesting. Um, are there ongoing efforts to control or eliminate non-native fish species? A number of years ago, and uh, this is talking maybe like 2010 time period, we found the first green sunfish in the Willamette River Basin. And not we personally, my our project, but it was Stan Gregory and, and folks from Oregon State University found them in a, in a pretty small area. We talked about at that point, should we just all drop everything we're doing and go out and try to kill these things as fast as possible and, and try to reduce the spread? And um, the more we started looking at that point, the more we found that the cat was already out of the bag. The Pandora's box was open. They were distributed further than we had access to and in broader habitats. And it's just, you know, it's like, dang it. So <laughs> had we been a couple of years earlier finding it, maybe we could have done something. But uh, anyway, the... Um, that is the control thing comes up and there are programs out there where people are trying to control say carp in some habitats for um you know carp can eat western pond they, juvenile western pond turtles and other things so it's like oh let's pull these carp out of here with that in mind there's no large scale control um programs for invasive species just because there's so many of them and the removal of invasive species oftentimes just means that another one comes in and um you know it's uh um it's a, it's a tough thing to fight. It's not like you can kill them in one habitat and then there's, okay, now they're gone in that habitat. We've done it in isolated ponds. We've done it in, you know, floodplain ponds where we want to put species into it. And we've done it in river reaches or areas above barriers where we're like, oh, this is good bull trout habitat. And we want to remove the brook trout um, from that habitat so they don't interbreed, hybridize, and, and make, you know, sterile offspring with, uh, with the, with the um, bull trout. So there's areas we've done it, but we we're not doing it whole scale. A wholesale on any habitats. And we have a lot of off-channel habitat that is inundated with non-native plants like Ludwigia. Yep. Some of this habitat isn't thought to be ideal for salmonids, uh, so we aren't prioritizing weed control in these places. Could we make an argument that Ludwigia uh, control might help the Oregon chub or lamprey? Yes, <laughs> that argument, I've tried to make that argument so much and uh, sometimes falls on deaf ears because people are very salmon focused but um i've also made the argument that you know ludwigia uh, you know breaks apart and that's how it moves and colonizes new habitats and leaving a habitat out because it's not ideal for salmon is um kind of short i feel a little short-sighted in that well that's a seed habitat to distribute the the um, ludwigia downstream during flood events so um you know, Western pond turtle, there was a, a recent news article where we're um, considering listing the Western pond turtle. So, you know, creating Western pond turtle habitat, creating habitat for, for lamprey, creating, um, you know, in a lot of these off-channel habitats are the rearing habitats for a lot of species. So you're, you know, something is using it or something was using it before Ludwigia took it over. 